In this video, we're gonna see how this transformed into this. Of how the landscape was reborn, of how biodiversity flourished, of how its owners found financial stability because of this transformation. This is of course the Nep Castle Estate, a pioneering rebuilding project here in the UK that has paved an alternative route down a wilder path that all UK farmers can follow if they wish. But first, let me tell the story of exactly what happened at this cloggy, claggy, clodgy, muddy agricultural estate, because that's exactly what it was and had been ever since the war. The Nepcastle estate had been for the best part of the last century intensively managed agriculture, with the Dig for Victory campaign during the war seeing the parkland closest to the house turned for crops. After the war, agriculture continued at Nep much like the rest of the UK. Meadows, peatlands, woodlands and hedgerows are all being cleared to facilitate more monoculture crops. And at NEP, the story was no different. By the time the now owners Charlie Burrell and Isabella Tree inherited the estate during the late 1980s, it was no let up in the pressure to run a productive farm here in the UK, being part of the common agricultural policy, whose damaging agenda was on producing as much food as possible through the use of damaging chemicals and intensive farming techniques. Charlie and Isabella worked tirelessly to to run a productive farm at NEP, but they were up against a tireless foe, the mud. Because you see, the land at NEP just is not conducive with modern farming techniques. And in the words of Charlie Burrow himself, he says that in the summer it's like concrete, and in the winter it's like unfathomable porridge. Unfathomable, that's a, that's a good word. And they struggled year after year through these heavy clay soils, continuously modernizing and diversifying and following the best practices that all the other farms on better soils seem to be having so much success with. And by the end of the 90s, with debts mounting up, the estate was facing financial ruin. It was at this point in February of 2000 that the decision was made to sell the dairy herds and farm machinery and put the arable out to contract, clearing the estate's debts. And this left Charlie and Isabella with a blank canvas, a chance to try something new. But this decision wasn't without criticism with one of their neighboring landowners labeling them as unpatriotic. But following this decision, it enabled them to think openly and to think freely about what to do next. And it led them to meeting with Dutch ecologist Franz Vera, who in that same year that Ned made this crucial decision also released his book in English, Grazing Ecology and Forest History. And the premise of his thinking is that the British landscapes and European landscapes, well before intensive management, any kind of agriculture, these landscapes would have been governed by large herbivores. Bison, aurochs and beavers creating a mosaic of open woodland with meadows, grasslands and water systems flowing freely creating a truly biodiverse dynamic landscape. In simple terms, Franz believes that if you want biodiversity to recover, all you have to do is release these large animals and let them kick off their natural processes, allowing them to do the work while we, as the ever tinkering humans that we are, we just sit back. And with this newfound idea, that's exactly what Charlie and Isabella began to do at NEP. Although work didn't begin straight away by releasing animals, they had to remove all of the land drains and around 70 miles of internal fencing. And that very summer, they noted the sounds of insects throughout the air. And for a period of around seven years, they allowed the land to just do its thing to recover. By this point, they had acquired funding to erect the ring fence around the estate so they could release grazing animals. And this is where the magic began to happen. Releasing the English longhorn, a proxy for the now extinct Uruk. However, the longhorns behave and interact with the environment in the same way, both browsing on trees and grazing on grass and carrying over 230 different seed species in their hooves, gut, and fur. And Exmoor ponies at NEP take the place of the extinct tarpon, but they again function in the same way, having a really interesting relationship with the cattle. You see, it's the horses which are able to eat through the much longer and coarser, rougher grasses and plant life. It opens up the much fresher and shorter grass lower down, which the cattle love. And you can also find roe, fallow, and red deer rubbing their horns and nibbling branches and defecating, all the while creating new opportunities for life. They haven't got wild boar at NEP, but they do have Tamworth pigs. And amazingly, at NEP, they've ob observed them swimming down to the bottom of the lake to retrieve mussels, but also, of course, causing great disturbance in the soils, rooting and lifting, creating spaces for all of the delicate wildflowers to flourish with protein-rich seeds. And it's this dynamic system of grazing disturbance and nutrient cycling of large free-roaming herbivores which has been lost from the UK, but you can start to see its impacts on a very small scale at NEP. But what has been so crucial at NEP is maintaining this perfect balance of herbivores and plant lives, 
that has yielded this like super diverse ecosystem. If you have two fewer grazers, what eventually happens to the landscape is you get close canopy woodland, which actually isn't that great for biodiversity. And if you have too many grazers, well, you get an overgrazed landscape. But in maintaining the habitat to allow for areas to be at different phases of succession, this has meant that NEP has exploded with wildlife. Hundreds of new bird species have visited or taken up residence at NEP. You will find all five species of owl. They have turtle doves, which during the 1960s had a population of 125,000, which is now just down to a couple thousand. But at NEP, they have as many as 30 or 40 individuals, which is far greater than any other conservation areas in the UK. They have one of the rarest species of bat, the Bechstein bat. And if you get down on the ground and have a look, you'll find countless species of dung beetle in the dung of cattle, but you do have to get down and have a look at it. And now they even have some nesting stalks, which is just amazing. But crucially for the landowners, NEP is making money. And one way is through ethical and sustainable meat production. I mentioned previously that it's important to keep the right assemblages of herbivores and without natural predators, they have to be culled. This puts healthy and sustainable and ethical meat on the market. They also receive high level stewardship from the government for the rewilding work that they do. And they also let out many of the older agricultural buildings to local businesses where they can set up. And this maintains something like 200 jobs. But I think most interestingly at NEP is their ecotourism business. You know, their wildlife safaris, their tours, their accommodation. And this generates around 460,000 pounds a year with a 20% profit margin. You no, and this venture doesn't just make them money, it also provides the British people with a first-hand experience of, of, of nature, of a wilder nature. And you know the really remarkable thing is that all of this took place in just 20 years. That's such a short time frame. It's testament to wildlife, you know, it knows what to do. All we have to do is just facilitate it and let it take the reins and it will find a way. But this success story shouldn't stop at NEP. This pioneering work and the lessons that we've learned can be applied across the UK. You know, obviously not every farm can be managed in this way, but how many small and struggling farms out there, just like NEP was, could benefit from adopting this type of management? Or how many larger farms and larger landowners could just do this on a smaller proportion of their land? To start an ecotourism business that could make infinitely more money than arable land ever could. And the reality is, is that over 70% of all UK land area is under some form of agriculture. So there's a huge opportunity for this. And another really exciting part of this is the new ELM scheme, environmental land management that is gonna pay landowners to effectively rewild their lands, to put nature first so that we can all as a country benefit from the many services that a healthy ecosystem can provide. Check out the stuff that's on the screen now, but in the meantime, thank you so much for watching, leave curious.